Hey guys, Rafi here from The Endgame Investor. I got an interview today with one of my rabbis, Rabbi Avi Grossman. If you're interested in anything he has talked about here or his outlook on the world generally and his wisdom, you can find it at Machon Shilo's YouTube channel, which there will be a link to in the description below. The history books will be written about this and they'll say that, yeah, there was an experiment that, ex that lasted for almost a century in the Western world. It was uh, silliness and, and it led to all sorts of terrible I, God knows what, that's what history books will say. And then the people eventually went back to a silver standard or to a standard that was a lot less uh, uh, tenuous and also uh, out of the hands of government bureaucrats. Rafi from the Endgame Investor. And today I have a unique guest. I haven't done this before, uh, interviewing a, a Rav, a rabbi. And Rav Avi Grossman, just a little bit about him. Um, we've all been through a lot of... Uh, bad experiences the last three years it's uh, gotten a little bit better this year thank god um but at the at the worst of it uh Rav avi grossman was uh one of the people who kept me together mentally and one of the few rabbanim that i trust not only for jewish law issues but for personal questions and setting an example and what should i do in this difficult situation um and i trust his judgment and that's uh, it's very rare these days. And, um, you know, whatever religion that we might be, we've had a lot of problems with our religious leaders. And you got to find the right ones. And um, it's not an easy job. So anyway, welcome, Rav Avi. And uh, looking forward to asking you these important questions. We'll begin with uh, the basic one that I asked is that there's a lot of libertarians on this channel that follow me because I'm a libertarian Jewish person or a Jewish libertarian. And there aren't... Um, it's not that Judaism is a libertarian religion, but there are a lot of libertarian aspects about it. But there are certain things about Judaism and the Torah and the Bible generally that go against uh, libertarian halacha or libertarian law, the primary one, which is the non-aggression principle. Basically, you do, not, you do not initiate aggressive force against other people. And that's a great thing, um, but it doesn't seem to be enough to stabilize a society because there's no spirituality in it. And a society that lacks spirituality eventually seems to fall apart is my feeling. So where do you draw the line between libertarianism and the Torah? Um, uh, are, the, are they consistent? Are they not consistent? How do you know what you're supposed to do in these situations where they conflict? So we, we believe that one day all mankind will come to the conclusion that we have come to that only God should be worshipped and not idols, etc. So perhaps libertarian ideas are part of that progression. Just like Maimonides saw some positives, although he was not pro-Islam and Christianity, for example, it does say it is a it does bring mankind closer to realizing certain necessary truths, necessary truths about a utopian future. It's better than paganism, for example. So libertarianism, like classical liberalism and other ideas, is, is a step up, but it certainly does not reach the Torah ideal. Uh, I think maybe we can make a distinction between what libertarianism calls for with regards to uh, religion and the uh, freedoms therefrom, uh, or thereof, and also the socio-political realm. Libertarianism makes a lot of claims. I remember, for example, the first time I heard of the idea that taxation equals theft. Now, theft is certainly uh, forbidden, just like murder. Murder and theft are some of the basic crimes that we consider uh, universal. The uh, Noach are told not to murder, they're told not to steal. So if you equate taxation with theft, you're saying taxation is basically a crime on the part of those imposing the taxes, and those who are paying the taxes are victims. However, you also know that it is clear from the Torah sources that, let's say, in a Jewish society, a Jewish king is given the right to tax his people up to 10%, 10% of the crops, 10% of the income, and uh, other such. So it cannot be that the Torah is permitting theft. Theft is forbidden. What the Torah permits is not a crime. And we also see the Torah implicitly, uh, if not explicitly, I wouldn't say it's explicit because I couldn't find it, let's say, in the Talmud. I couldn't find it if Maimonides brings it that a Gentile king can tax his subjects. But the Torah does assume in many places that the Gentile kings do impose taxes on their people or on even their Jewish subjects, when applicable, and that is totally legitimate. And you think about it also, there's a good case for taxation because society does have to pay. Someone has to pay for the lights outside and the garbage collection or, I guess, 
running an army. So well, just, well um, just let me interrupt you for a second. A, a pure libertarian would say that, for example, garbage collection would be much better off privatized because then um, you wouldn't have the city just dumping stuff into a landfill. You'd, it would be sorted according to value and you'd have farmers picking up organic waste and and, uh, you know, computer guys picking up uh, computer waste, et cetera. And it would work very well. And there wouldn't be uh, there wouldn't be all these landfills that were wasting resources. Um, but the, the other thing I wanted to, to go in here is that, yeah, maybe taxation is not us or it's not forbidden um, by Torah law. But it it's all it's also I don't think it's ideal because you have uh, these verses when uh, Moses, when Moshe Rabbeinu is speaking, he says things like, I never took a single thing from them. I never taxed them at all. Um, and, uh, and, and Shmuel and Samuel warning people against the king because he would, he would tax them. And this is not an ideal. You don't want it. Yeah. And it's just a right of the king. It's not, it's not a commandment of the king. He doesn't have to tax if he doesn't want to, or if he doesn't need to. I was just trying to say that I would not equate taxation with theft. Mm -hmm. That just as an example that some, many libertarians, uh, consider the taxation as theft is one of the animamims. Remember, uh, we, we already discussed previously the, the Shema Yisrael of, of libertarianism is uh, the non-aggression principle, which is quite as similar to uh, Hillel's uh, claim. What's the golden rule of Hillel? The, uh, no, no, that's that's the other one. The, the that which is distasteful to you, that which is distasteful to you, do not do to your fellow. Similar to the non-aggression principle, he considers everything else to be part of Perush of the basic idea of loving one's fellow as oneself. So you do see echoes of this main idea in Talmudic thought. However, you don't see all of it. And certainly the idea that there should be, like I said before, religion, religious-wise, that people should just be allowed to do whatever they want. The Torah certainly doesn't uh, prescribe that for Jews or for Gentiles. Gentiles are not supposed to have religion, or they're, and they're definitely not supposed to be making things up or uh, having uh, other philosophical I guess, uh, uh, philosophical paradigms that they use to run their lives. They're not supposed to do it. They're supposed to look to us for what's kosher. And even among the Jews, we have religious imposition. We do not allow Sabbath des desecration and uh, the like. Uh, the, a Jewish society would not allow uh, a purveyor of, let's say, non-kosher food to open up shop right in the middle of Jerusalem and sell his wares. That's just not something we would allow. So when you look at libertarianism, you have to say, what where does this fit with halachic Judaism and where does it not? I think that it certainly has its advantages, by the way, over many other things. Uh, Churchill said that about democracy. It's pretty bad, but it's, it's so far it's pretty good. I think that we still have a long ways to go before uh, we figure out what is the best form of government on our own, or we could just look to the Torah for guidance. Uh, strangely enough, the Torah doesn't, doesn't prescribe a proper form of government for, let's say, the world at large. It only tells you what Jews should have, right? Actually, th this is also an interesting point that I noticed that the, in two different parshas and two different Torah portions, there are the ideas of governmental systems that that show up, but they're specifically uh, not prescribed by God. The first is from Yitro, from Jethro, who prescribes a certain way of organizing a society, and there's no real hard evidence that we actually used his advice. Um, and the second one is from uh, Baha'u'llah's plan, last week's parsha, when Moshe Rabbeinu, when Moses basically has a nervous breakdown, he can't handle this anymore. And so God says, well, you know, okay, well, calm down for a second and uh, I'll put your power on 70 other people and they can help you out. But basically, he didn't. It, God didn't prescribe a governmental system. And that seems to have been purposeful, because if he did, then these governmental these, these bureaucrats would have divine sanction and say, look, God picked me because, look, the Torah says have this kind of government, and now I have that power. I can do whatever I want. That's very dangerous, it seems to me. Okay. Uh, I'll address that, first of all, last week's Parsha or this week's Parsha, depending where you are. Uh, for mm -hmm. our friends in Kutzlar, it's, it's going to be this week's Parsha, I think. So there you have to take note of the fact that there always seems to have been this institution of 70 elders and 12 tribal leaders among the Israelites. They preceded the Exodus. Moses, when he showed up in Egypt to announce, uh, I guess to first start spreading the message that he had gotten uh, the, of the, the deliverance. So what happened? He had to gather the 70 elders. And suddenly, even though we heard about these 70 elders in Exodus, in, in our parasha, we find that they're gone and they have to, we have to reappoint them. And mysteriously enough, the 12 tribal leaders who were mentioned a number of times in the previous parashiot, 
are no longer mentioned at all. They seem to have disappeared also. Rashi addresses this, among other interpreters, aside from Fazal, uh, who preceded him, points out that immediately before the incident you were describing, it says that the people were uh, they, they were punished by God. It says, It says they were punished there. Uh, fire burned among the people, and it consumed at the edges of the camp. And Chazal point out, what does it mean at the edges of the camp? It means it took out their kisinim, their leaders. And this would explain why suddenly Moses is complaining, oh, I can't handle this anymore. It's all upon me. The leadership that existed until that point was suddenly eliminated. The 70 elders, the first round of them, who had been around for the last two years, and the 12 tribal leaders, including Aaron's own brother-in-law, Nachshon ben Aminadav, were killed at that point. And that's why they're not to be seen anymore. We have a tradition, by the way, positive tradition. It's not that it's uh, positive means it's explicit. It doesn't mean that it's not disputed. But a positive tradition that Nachshon ben Aminadav died this year uh, after the Exodus, the, the second year. This is by the way, just for context, Nachshon ben Aminadav is the, the head of Judah, um, yes. and he's part of the line that leads to King David eventually. Yes, and the point I had made is that he's also a relative of theirs. His sister was married to Aaron. And mm -hmm. suddenly, he's gone. And so are the rest of them, by the way. Elishama ben Amihud, the leader of the tribe of Ephraim, who also happens to be Joshua's grandfather. Yeah. All, all of these great men are suddenly gone. That's why Moses has to ask God for help. And he's told explicitly, go get 70 new elders, 70 men who have already shown that their character uh, warrants their appointment. So that's so, interesting. You're saying the entire government was basically wiped out. Uh, yes, that's what I'm saying. And that's what Rashi alludes to. And that explains what's going on. This is, I think, the Abarbanel uh, uses this to resolve what is a seeming contradiction. You mentioned the Jethro case. Jethro told, saw that Moses was overburdened with uh, having to answer the people's questions and decide their disputes. That seems to be in context after reading the Torah, but certainly before they left Mount Sinai, because it says that this took place at Mount Sinai. The Israelites basically encamped at Mount Sinai from Rosh Chodesh Siwan, shortly after the Exodus, until the ER in the ensuing year, almost 11 months and a few weeks. So sometime there, Jethro had given this advice of Moses appointing uh, men in charge of every 10, every 100, every 1,000. And in the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses seems to be describing this institution. He, he ascribes this institution to himself. He says that I couldn't handle it anymore, so I had to appoint leaders for everybody and a, a, like a system, a hierarchy. I wouldn't say bureaucracy. Uh, we, we, hadn't gotten, we hadn't gotten that far off the derrick yet. And this hierarchy, like I said, the attribution seems to be off. In Exodus, it's attributed to Jethro, and in Deuteronomy, Moses attributes it to, to himself. And the resolution is that originally at Mount Sinai, they had elders and they had tribal leaders. That's 82 men in total, uh, 70 plus 12. But they didn't adjudicate every single case that came up. And it's kind of surprising. And their job wasn't also to teach the Torah. Only Moses possessed the Torah, and he would only finish teaching it to uh, the people over the course of the next 38 years. It can't be somehow, we consider it basically miraculous that he received all of it at Sinai over the course of 40 days, had it all stay up in here, and the entire methodology that we consider the Torah B'Shav al was also included in their software and the hardware. It's a whole system for deriving everything. So they had to, they had yet to learn it. So that's what Jethro was teaching Moses to do. And eventually, sometime later, which is about, I, I guess, uh, about 11 months later, because the incident that described in this week's parasha in uh, Numbers, where, where Moses suddenly has to appoint 70 new men uh, to be the elders and 12 tribal leaders, which is not explicit, by the way. We only hear about new tribal leaders later in the book, but still, new tribal leaders. So what happened is that Moses had, to, had a system that was of judges and a system of leaders, 70 plus 12, and judges who are teachers and also resolve disputes. And Moses lost many of these men and suddenly had to reinstitute the whole system here. So he had to do it himself, and that's why he's complaining to God. And that's why the complaint that Moses has at the beginning of Deuteronomy, I can't handle this all by myself, matches the complaint we read in this week's parasha. So God told him, well, first of all, for appointing judges, you already have Jethro's system, so you have to make sure to fill in all the openings. 
And as for the fact that you just lost the 12 tribal leaders and the 70 elders, so I'm going to give you a way of reappointing the 70 elders who need to have a certain form of divine inspiration. And Wait, hold on. Can I ask a question here? What, yeah. Why why was it why was it that the entire government was wiped out? Even Nachshon ben Aminadav, who we have a tradition, is the first to go into the sea and in, in an amazing act of faith. What did he like? Are, is it saying that all? Is this saying that all governments eventually corrupt? And even if you have the best people, like what happened there? I don't think so. I, I certainly don't think so. What happened? We have to ask this question: What happened to that generation? I'd also like to point out that, that it seems through resolution of uh, seeming contradictions at the beginning of this book, the tribal leaders were appointed by God in ER, but they already had their roles months before that. So what's going on? It says that the tribal leaders were present at the dedication of the tabernacle, including Nachshon, we keep mentioning. He was the first one to offer his personal tribute at the inauguration of the tabernacle. And then it says that in ER, when Moses was first to count the people, Here's the 12 men that God has chosen, who has appointed. And it's the, same 12, it's the same 12 men who have all along been the leaders of these tribes we read about later. So what's going on here? The answer is that originally the leaders of each tribe were organic leaders. They were the natural leaders of, of their peoples. Each tribe considered themselves independent, by the way. And Nachshon, in let's say his particular case, was clearly the man best uh uh, I, I guess, best for the job within his tribe. And it was God basically putting his stamp of approval on his appointment as leader of his people when he uh, declared that Nachshon and all the others were to help Moses count the people. And presumably, once they had all died, then the tribes once again were supposed to do the, I guess, go through the whatever organic process it was to find who is next in line to lead each tribe. Only later do we do we read, by the way, that there are actual God uh, once again, stamp of approval on these tribal leaders. Who would, by the way, think about this. Who do you think would be the most qualified to be leader of the tribe of Judah from what we know if suddenly Naksha would be gone? Who else would be qualified to lead his tribe? Mm, I don't Answer. know. So I think Kalev ben Yefune is his right, yeah. second cousin. And so, okay, yeah, Kalev was uh, the spy that did not rebel and he yeah. uh, encouraged people to go and conquer Canaan and conquer Canaan and uh, he was uh, he survived uh, the generation, yeah. For the Israelis, that's this week's parsha. So Kalev is a natural uh, a choice, at least from what we know. There's not that many uh, prominent Judahites we read about, but he's there. And indeed, we look in parsha's Matos Base, and he's there. He's been chosen as the next leader of his tribe. And like I mentioned, Yeshua, I would think that Yeshua's grandfather was a leader of Ephraim until this point. So Yeshua would be a natural leader, uh, one of the I guess candidates, if not Nun himself, Yeshua's father, to be leader of Ephraim. But instead, he's got promoted. He's leader of the entire people. Uh, King is Maimonides refers to him. So I think that we have to be very clear about this. We have to instead ask this question. These men were approved of by God, yet they were all uh, dead eventually. Nadav and Avihu also, the Chazal described, Aaron's two older sons were the natural successors to Moses and Aaron. And the Gemara describes them in the Sanhedrin as actually being sort of impatient. When will we get a chance to lead these people. And the, the joke was on them because who buried who, as the Gemara says. The answer mm -hmm. is uh, the tragedy that we know about. So we look in the words of our sages, and by the way, that's why Rashi's commentary is so great, because he helps you reference, even if you could dispute how Rashi, uh, on a point-by-point -point basis, how Rashi chooses to interpret something, which which Midrashic and Agatic teaching he, teachings he brings to resolve these difficulties, he still gives you a good uh, taste of the way Chazal thought. And Chazal actually addressed this. Chazal pointed out that all of these great leaders, Nadav, Avihu, the 70 elders, the 12 tribal leaders, they all had done something that in God's eyes, because they're held to such high standards, warranted their removal before making it to the land of Canaan. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Moses and Aaron fell into the same category. And this is, by the way, a good resolution of how we can understand why eventually Moses and Aaron themselves are punished, I guess you could say, with not being able to lead the people into land. They almost got there, the last men standing. Moses at the age of 119, Aaron at the age of 123 or 122, were basically punished. Oh, you can't lead the people into land because you struck the rock or whatever it is you did. And they've shown him. And all the commentators 
are scratching their heads trying to figure out what exactly Aaron and Moses did to deserve such a harsh punishment, even if they're held to such high standards. And the basic answer is that really they were included in the leadership of the first generation that left Egypt, and they all had to go eventually. And everything that we see is basically what they say in, in Hebrew, modern Hebrew, it's he roots, almost an excuse, excuse, or we're looking for something just to just just to push them over the edge. So there had something that had happened among all this leadership that had disqualified them. And God was just looking for the opportunity, so to speak, to bring about their downfalls, which is, uh, by the way, if, 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 if the sages hadn't said this before me, I wouldn't have had the chutzpah to say such a thing. I'm just trying to explain it to you based on what we've seen. So Moses and Aaron actually did not deserve to enter the land of Canaan just because they struck the rock or whatever it was, or they might have made a mistake. Moses and Aaron are, were human. We read about their mistakes previously. It's because the whole leadership was had to go with their generation. Their generation was not going to go into the land of Israel, so they all had to go at a certain point. They also mention that the leaders at, at Mama and Sinai, which is the revelation of Sinai, they had also perhaps gone too far, enjoyed uh, gazing at God's uh, divine entourage, so to speak, and that warranted eventually their removal. He couldn't punish them then, so each one in his time, Nadav and Avihu, when their time came, then the Seam and the and the the elders and the Seam as the tribal leaders a month later, and Aaron and Moses thirty eight years later. So you could say you could say that this is a precedent for term limits. Uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that. I don't think uh, term limits are you know let's say when they propose them in Western countries, what they up to a decade, four years or ten years, six years, whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, or two, two terms. Like many uh, of our greatest Jewish leaders, was blessed with a term of forty years. And mm -hmm. it says that perhaps it would, that's usually what it is. But it's not that we say that, oh, beyond 40 years, these, these men are corrupt. But more that, it just so happens that Dor Holeich with Dor Ba, the, the candle goes out on one, the sun sets here, and the sun has to rise somewhere else. Really, it would have been great if Moses' candle had continued burning, so to speak, for more than 40 years. But that's basically considered a complete generation. The greatest men serve for 40 years, and then their time comes, and we have to pass the torch. But it doesn't mean that every single leader who gets a position as an elder or as a tribal leader or as a judge should be limited to a certain extent. I think that even even if there is a logic to the idea of political term limits, but I, I certainly don't think that that's what the Torah is getting at. Okay. So um, I want to switch gears here to uh, to money. Uh, there's two uh, two points um, about the, the nature of, uh, excuse me, fiat currency. My question is, we haven't we haven't really dealt with these questions for thousands of years, and there isn't that much in Chazal and our in our sources that that deal with the nature of what fiat money is. But I have two uh, I have two things that I want to point to in the the pasuk and the verse that a king is not allowed to accumulate too much gold and silver. So um, my 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 chiddush on that. I know you're not you know we're not allowed to uh, create our own kava homers and uh, the you know or our own a four shiur arguments, but I can't resist. Just making this point that if a king is not allowed in Deuteronomy to uh, to accumulate gold and silver too much, whatever that means, then Kalva Homer, a fortiori, he should not be allowed to have a printing press where he has the only right to issue receipts for this gold and silver and thereby be able to inflate the money supply and extract value from the people. So it would seem to me that that fiat money, or at least a monopoly on fiat money, would be forbidden. And second, um, there's a comment that I really like in uh, in Yeshayahu at the beginning of Isaiah, where where Isaiah, where Yeshayahu is is um, is railing that uh, he asks a question like, "How did this happen?" He sees that the society completely falls apart, and he's and the pasuk says, I think in verse 22, that kaspecha um, sigim that your your silver is full of dross or that it's inflated or it's clipped, uh, and he's and and the Malbim says there is the 19th century commentary that it, that this is this is Yeshayahu's answer to the question: How did how did the society get full of murderers like this? How did this happen? It wasn't overnight. He says it starts with inflation. That your that your silver becomes dross and it gets clipped, and then you start using this money and and violating weights and measures, and then you're you're okay with this low level of theft because it doesn't really hurt anyone that much. And then you you proceed down the level of corruption from there, and eventually you turn into a society of murderers. So is it? Do you think that when whenever it is that we pull it all together and make a society that actually makes sense. Is fiat money even mutter? Can you have it? Okay, so 
I think I'll address this question. Most basically speaking, fiat money, uh, a creation of uh, modern monetary theories, is something that might not be recognized by the sages. Uh, it, it doesn't really make much sense. It's only because the United States was so powerful, let's say, in the middle and late 20th century, that this whole house of cards was able to stand up for so long. But I don't think it will. I, I do not believe that the criticism they have of King Solomon and the Deuteronomic uh, injunction against the king having too much gold and silver has to do with the problems of a king who can print his own currency and bring about inflation. I don't think that that's what it's talking about there. I think that's uh, much more basic. Uh, and it's comparable to so-called the having horses and too many wives. Too many horses, too many wives. Too many horses means having too much desire for military power. Uh, horses represent the ability to have an army that can project itself. And it's connected, the sages say, to going back to Egypt. I heard this from Rabbi Alex Israel, by the way. Uh, he, he has said that Egypt at the time of Solomon, that was the world power. That was the local power and the world power. So Solomon sought to make an alliance, a political alliance, and by family alliance, with Pharaoh, the Pharaoh at the time. So having all those horses from Egypt was Solomon's way of building up military power, not because Solomon fought many wars, which he did not. Uh, it was in order to be able to project power. And so too with the women. Having too many women will lead anybody astray. It should be obvious. And the problem is Solomon basically reasoned that these didn't apply to him, he wouldn't be corrupted. But he was corrupted by his growth of potential military power and his, his political alliances. And it says that his wives, whatever this is, this could be a whole other lecture, uh, what, what it was that his wives did to him that corrupted him. And so too with his acquisition of money, uh, which I, that's bad translation, silver and gold, by the way. But when does keset, the biblical word for silver, the Mishnaic word for silver, the rabbinic word for silver, when does that properly become money? I think already the sages, they use the word mamon, which is not a native Hebrew word, and it's related to the word money. By the way, you look at there, you see the word money in mamon. So they used, they made this distinction, but then again, they were talking about that's property that's not necessarily silver. The point is that when it says that a king should not have too much silver and gold, it's that he not be corrupted by his riches. When people get too rich, they become too pampered and they distract themselves. I don't think Solomon was necessarily inflating the currency or that was a problem that could lead to it. What the, what the Malbim is talking about there and by the way, the other Mepharshim also mentioned this, Kaspech uh, Hayal Esirim, Isaiah is addressing Mother Zion, as though the society is personified by Zion, a, a woman. And he's saying that you're just like your wine is diluted with water. He says the wine is diluted and the silver is basically, how do you dilute silver? When you're melting it down, you add other alloys in there, you put more dross. Dross would be, I guess, the tin and uh, sometimes copper. use copper and the metals. Yeah. They, they basically put those other metals into the mix so that what looks like a silver coin and should have a certain weight, it has its its, its weight, its values, its weight in silver is suddenly actually worth less. And some say it was the caleb when you make uh, a clee, a vessel of some sort that's supposed to be of silver and it has less silver than you than is actually supposed to be there. The whole Archimedes uh, puzzle that led to his principle. How do you know all the gold is there? How do you know all the silver is there? You can figure it out by weight and mass, the, the relative density. That's what he's criticizing them. He's criticizing the fact that these, he's criticizing them for diluting their silver and therefore being corrupt monetarily. And he says, yes, yeah, so it's a hop, skip, and jump away from basically leading to bloodshed and other injustices. I mean, the worst injustice is bloodshed. The first injustice is pouring a little water into the wine, adding a little dross to the silver. But I don't think he was talking about the potential problem with fiat currency, even if the problem of fiat currency exists. The sages started getting to this problem. The sages talk about buying back and paying back debts with what they call payroad. Payroad isn't necessarily fruit. It means products. Sometimes they realize that the value of a particular commodity increases or decreases over time. And paying back debts, what is supposed to be a certain amount of silver, they say, well, I'll pay it back in fruits. But suddenly the fruits are a lot more valuable or a lot less valuable. So you in, end up with a, a question that, by, by the way, is a whole chapters in the Talmud concerning this idea. Which is why, for many issues, the sages said, just stick to the silver standard, sometimes the gold standard. You're familiar with this uh, with this halakha, that yeah. because they realized that silver, as long as you're keeping silver decent, as you're not diluting your silver, it's actual silver, 
silver will maintain its value. That's basically an objective standard uh, of of wealth or, or of, of uh, defining wealth. And for certain commandments and certain halachot, commandments, I mean, when the Torah prescribes using money or silver for something, and halachot, when the sages ordained that we keep to certain standards, the sages used the silver standard. So you know, halachot is on a silver standard. Yeah, Jewish law is silver standard based. That's I, yeah. I recognize that point, yeah. The silver standard also incorporates a gold standard. Sages recognize that. Most people have silver. Silver is a good way to make coins and also just silver pieces. Remember, when they say a shekel, shekel means a weight. It doesn't necessarily have to be minted. We'll talk about minting in a minute. With guarding, let's say, obligations, monetary obligations, a person takes upon himself uh, the obligation to support his wife, and he signs the halachic prenup agreement. The sages referred to as the kithubah. And what is it? What is a, how does a man obligate himself in those cases to pay a certain amount of silver? Now let's get into the idea of minting. The sages did recognize that certain for certain halachot. The coin in there has to be coinage. You have to can't just take raw silver or silver pieces that have certain weights to them. They actually have to be minted. Now, it could very well be that because we look into history, we find that minting silver actually postdates uh, a lot of biblical commandments. Correct? Yeah. In the, in the times, of, let's say Hezekiah, late late first temple times, that they were beginning, I think, to discover how to mint coinage in uh, in China, and the Lydians. Who were basically the 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 greatest the greatest coiners, the ones who came up with this whole thing, rich as Croesus. So they they postdate the first temple, that second temple times. But the sages for a lot of these halachot did demand that the silver be minted properly, recognized by the king. And the sages tacked on this halacha also. They derived this from uh, a hint in the pasuk. It talks about redeeming the second tithe. The second tithe is taken from a man's crops in the first, second, fourth, and fifth years of the sabbatical cycle. He's supposed to take a second tithe from his produce. The first tithe goes to the Levites. The second tithe is for himself. Have you ever given give, pay taxes to yourself? No, it means he takes from his crop of grapes. He takes a 10% of what's left after giving all the other tithes to the, the Levites, the, the priests, etc. He takes that 10%, and that's for him to consume in Jerusalem as a, as a rite of holiness. And if he cannot take those actual fruits, because you know fruit, fruit is perishable, he is supposed to exchange those fruits for minted money and take that money to Jerusalem and use that money to buy food, regular food in Jerusalem, which suddenly becomes sanctified with the sanctity that those fruits originally had, which got passed to this money, which now gets passed to this fruit, with this uh, other food that he's bought in Jerusalem, and eat that within sanctity. As I said, literally, it was referring to in Moses' time to bundle up the money because if you're traveling, you want to bundle your money and take it to the place that God shall choose and use that to buy food. That's what it says in Deuteronomy. And the sages said that Sartal also has this idea of a tzur, uh, or a tzura, which means a form. You have to use money that has a form for this. So it, it, I think it's mistaken to say that, oh, the sages always understood that this money has to be minted. In First Temple times, there was no such thing as minted coins. King David did not put out his own limited edition or his, he didn't have a mint. He just had silver pieces and gold pieces. What it means is that the sages tacked on this obligation that the money have uh, be coined money. It has to be minted properly and have, I guess, the picture of whichever king is around at the time in order to fulfill this biblical commandment. And the sages did this in many other places. They attached to a biblical commandment their own secondary rabbinic obligations and uh, I guess, what Chazal call a sniff or uh, Abiza Raihu, uh, another facet to this. Accoutrement, yeah. yeah. That's that's a good word. So I hope that hope that clarifies things, that the sages recognized the silver standard, but the sages also eventually recognized in the classical era that it is the local king's authority to determine what coinage is legal, and the sages also recognized that, and they, they demanded that certain uh, for certain transactions that the Torah demands or that are, are governed by law be using these uh these local coins but i don't think the sages imagined that eventually uh, let's say uh, a roosevelt gemachimo would arise and confiscate everybody's silver and gold and declare that from now on the only money that exists is paper notes or 
Sigim. Sigim, like we said, is the inferior metals. Just say, you know what? Now you could no silver and gold in your coins anymore. It's all the coins are going to be Sigim, or the coins are just going to be uh, pieces of paper, really, really fancy pieces of paper, and use that for transactions. Uh, like I said, that that that's a house of cards, and it's only because the United States was such a hegemony around the world that it was able to hold up so long. And and many of us are actually uh, cowering. I don't think we're just waiting to watch because it's going to create all sorts of financial crises when it actually does happen. It's going to collapse, and we're actually we're seeing it we're seeing it in front of our eyes right now. And eventually, the history books will be written about this, and they'll say that yeah, there was an experiment that ex that lasted for almost a century in the Western world. It was uh, silliness, and and it led to all sorts of terrible, I, God knows what. That's what history books will say. And then the people eventually went back to a silver standard or to a standard that was a lot less uh, uh, tenuous, and also uh, out of the hands of government bureaucrats who were trying to impose their uh, limited understanding to forces that are certainly beyond their own control. Okay. So uh, my next my next question is more of a universal Colel uh, question, and that is as someone who's not who's not a fan of government at all, and but I recognize that there are better governments and worse governments. I certainly recognize that, um, and I think well from what I see, the message all the way from uh, from Shmuel from the Book of Samuel until the end of the Book of Kings, and arguably the Book of Judges also, Shoftim, from before there were any kings, is that, look, you could have good government and it could make your society very rich and powerful, as it did in Solomon's time, and David was also a good king. But eventually, even Solomon himself was corrupted, and the corruption, just there were, there were fits and breaks in it, and we had these intermittently good kings, but they weren't able to pass that on, and it, it, just, it just fell apart. So when we, when we pray or when we yearn for a Davidic uh, return or a Messiah or a Mashiach, um, are we just, are we supposed to just ignore that it didn't work last time? Why would it work this time? Or do we just ascribe magical characteristics to the next uh, Davidic um, inheritor? Um, but how do like, how, I'm saying, how do I, how do I pray for this if I really don't want it? And I, I don't, no, I'm saying I don't want redemption. I do. Um, but it's hard as a libertarian to pray for the return of a specific form of government. It just doesn't jive with me. And, um, and I don't, I don't really know what to request when I'm saying that bracha. Mm -hmm. Let, let's start from the beginning. Does the Torah prescribe government? Let's take Jews and Gentiles. Does the Torah prescribe government for Jews or for Gentiles? Um, not any specific form of it, no. So I'll, I'll tell you an example that perhaps we can. We're thinking in our own terms. We think of government. And we think of, let's say, an executive and a legislature. We think of the judiciary, right? American style. And we look at other places in Israel. We say, well, they sort of combine the executive with the legislative. And the judiciary is just a bunch of elites who are not connected. But let's think about this in terms of what, let's say, Maimonides saw in, in, in Shas. And basically, you also find this in Rashi. What is it? God has already commanded that the Gentiles have judges. They have to have a system of courts. And it doesn't say anywhere that the Gentiles have to therefore have a king. You could disconnect, let's say, an executive. Perhaps you can put executive powers in the hand of the court. In many places in the Talmud, the sages also assume, rightfully so, that there's the main form of what you and I call government is run by the judges, men who are wise, properly ordained, they're carrying on a tradition, and they are given many of the powers that you and I would uh, today give to government, they say that those are their roles, and including declaring war, raising an army, uh, taking on the, the let's say, even uh, what you call welfare type uh, responsibilities. They're supposed to take care of the orphans in society, among other things. They're supposed to take care of uh, the economy. That's what the elders and the judges are supposed to do. The fact that we do not have a Sanhedrin, for us, a Sanhedrin is basically uh, a Greek nickname for the institution of 70 elders who are headed, by the way, by a Nasi. And we've always had such a thing. There always has to be a leader of the Sanhedrin. And his title, Nasi, is not coincidental. That's the same type of term used throughout Ezekiel to describe the eventual Messianic king. 
And the Nasi is the term used throughout the five books of Moses to describe the leaders of the tribes, as we discussed before, and also the type of man who is basically a king. So the Jewish people are supposed to have a Sanhedrin, and the Gentiles are supposed to have courts of law that function according to the Torah. The Torah for Gentiles, by the way, which is totally legitimate. That is the first thing we're supposed to have. And then we get beyond that. I guess it's the difference between king with a lowercase k and king with an uppercase k, just like judges with a lowercase j or an uppercase j. In English, we can see this distinction. There's the book of judges. They were given a title. Those judges, like Samson, I don't think Samson ever sat in a court of law and heard a case. But I do think Gideon did, because he was a judge in both respects. It used to be that the type of people who start off as relative leaders, uh, local leaders, who can solve disputes and eventually lead the, na the nation in uh, policies that have to bind everybody. So we call them judges with capital J, like the book of Judges. And so too with kings. You have a king with a lowercase k, someone who's, for all intents and purposes, a natural leader and is therefore recognized by halakha. Maimonides recognizes Joshua and Gideon and Samuel even as kings with a lowercase k, not because they wore a crown, not because they were anointed with the with the oil that normally chosen kings are to be anointed with, not because they took taxes even. It's because they were the natural leader and the heads of their Sanhedrins. And then you have king with the capital K, like King David, who filled all those roles. He originally was, by the way, an organic leader, a natural leader. But eventually he was given the stamp of approval and he was able to, you know, have a crown, have a hereditary monarchy. He was anointed. He could collect taxes. His son certainly did all that. And that was a big complaint about him. So we're supposed to have these things. When you pray for restoration, first, look what else you're praying for in your Shemon Esra. Aren't you praying for the restoration of our judges? Hashiva Shofetina Kvarishana. First, you want a proper form of government. By the way, the king is extremely limited in Torah law. He's limited to what the Sanhedrin allows him to do. The Sanhedrin defines what the Torah is. The Sanhedrin interprets the Torah. The Sanhedrin legislates. The Sanhedrin can cancel laws. The king can only work within that which the Sanhedrin allows him. And he's appointed by the Sanhedrin. That's the way it's supposed to be. So I don't think you should fear, uh, at, let's say, going back to the way it was. It's true that we've had a pretty bad track record with kings, let's say. Many kings, it says, they did which was evil in the eyes of God. That's a high standard, by the way. Most of the Davidic kings were quite well from a human perspective. And even the kings of the Ten Tribes, they were liked by their subjects. Their subjects wanted them and approved of them. It's only because where you have the, law, the works of the prophets who are very harsh on the condemnation, condemnation of any king whatsoever. I think, for example, that Yerubim II, if it hadn't maintained Yerubim's policies of those shrines that Beit Allen done with the golden calves, he would have been considered a great man. And there are many, we would have we would have kept records of how great he was to his people, but we do not. Even an Ahab, who was a sinner, besides from the fact that he was worshiping Baal, was a great military leader, and his social economic policy was great for his people. The idolatry was the problem, so that's how we observe him as always a bad king. I don't think the track record from a human perspective was that bad of the kings, but more so. Even if we could say, yeah, well, there was a king, let's say, King uh, Menashe, who apparently was not good to his subjects. That would be Hezekiah's son. He yeah, was also it's, an idol. It's, uh, I think the Pesach is that he filled Yerushalayim with the, blood, blood, with the blood. blood of the innocent. Yes. So you take a person like him, it's not because, oh, the institution of Jewish monarchy is, uh, I guess, doomed. It has a very bad track record, will we'll usually lead to some sort of crisis. No, it's because that particular king, that iteration of monarchy was a failure. So, too, you could have many cases of, let's say, democracy, oligarchy, uh, na name your archies, whatever you have around the world and whatever you've had, let's say, in the 20th century, where we had a lot of experience and well-documented what's going on in, in, in various regimes. None of them were perfect. Everybody had their problems. I think, for example, I laugh at the situation we have in America right now. They're supposed to be a democracy. And they're supposed to have a, a republic in some respects. And they're supposed to have constitutionally guaranteed rights. And you see what's going on there, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't think anybody has a perfect track record. So the fact that you can point to a bad king like Menashe doesn't mean that we should fear this. I think on the contrary, if we first have a Sanhedrin, by the way, I've been saying this a lot. People have been asking about this all week long. So this is about every day I say this. 
you're first supposed to have a Sanhedrin. Even if you're talking about a Gentile society, you're first supposed to have a proper system of courts, law and order first. Fazal said, don't bash the government. This is Pirkei Avos. Why? Because not for government, people would be eating each other alive. The first and foremost role of any government in any human society is to have a system of law and order. The laws we have already we were given to them by Moses. We, they were, those were given to us by Moses. How to enforce the law? You're supposed to have a proper police force. And then, as you know, the next role of government is national security. And a king just sits at the head of those uh, of those systems. A proper Davidic king only involves himself in national security and doing justice. And Chazal said, if he's not a Davidian, we don't even allow him into the court system. He's he's immune, he's immune, and he doesn't get involved in the courts. And we hope that he'll be replaced eventually by a proper Davidian. So I, I think that, on the contrary, you should learn to pray for a restitution of the Davidic monarchy, and that the chosen Davidic monarch be exactly like King David was. Uh, you could actually see here, uh, King David, I remember teaching some uh, high school students, uh, girls, about King David, and we have to get to the part where uh, he's criticized, you know, David's classic sin. How, how, to what extent did he sin? We interpret that. How do we look at such a great person? And then we read all that we know about King David from Ghazal's Midrashim, which, by the way, seems to be historical accounts of his exemplary character and how big he, he was in Chassidut, not talking about uh, Beshti in Chassidut, but Chassidut before the, Chass the Hasidic movement. Piety, and piety, piety, translate. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was a great man. He was beloved by his people. And by the way, that's what his name seems to mean. Beloved, it's really to Rigididia and his son also. So David was, was the ultimate leader of the Jewish people, the paradigm, the, the model that we are going for. And if you think about that, and you, you pray for such a thing, or let's say a Solomon before he himself was corrupted by his his own going beyond his, his, uh, the limits that the... That the that the Torah imposed on him, so that that's something we should look forward to. Uh, I think that any any Davidic monarch, or I, I choose any Davidic monarch any day over any other system of government that we have right now. Uh, I think that our our we've been colored by this by the fact that it's so far away in history, and the sages had so many, and the prophets also had so many harsh things to say about them. But really, their track record was really good, especially if they are reigned in by a Sanhedrin. I think Samuel share, shared the spear with of yours. It says in the Medrash that Samuel saw David. He was supposed to anoint David just as a teenager. And he saw that he looked like uh, he had murderous tendencies. He had an Esau like look to him. Yeah. And God it says yeah, Esau, uh, Esau, Esau, uh, Esau and David. Es Esau yeah. and David are the only two characters in Tanakh, I think, that are described as Admoni or redheaded or something like that. Yeah, or ruddy. Whatever it means, David had Esau like outer look to him, perhaps even personality. And uh, God assured the prophets. Don't worry, if he if he has a tendency to bloodshed, we'll do it on the permission of the sage uh, of the Sanhedrin, the sages. So that that's what we're going for. First, first work on our Sanhedrin. By the way, we will not have any Messiah the way anybody imagines it. We will not have a messianic king unless he's recognized by the Sanhedrin. They're the ones who appoint the king. So first, first work on your Sanhedrin, which by the way is is uh even though it's it's a daunting task, it is not inconceivable. Maimonides already gave a plan for how to do it. And by the way, if you're thinking, wait a minute, that's just Maimonides. We don't believe in reinstituting the Sanhedrin. Let's say we just take the Shulchan Aruch, the Beis Yosef, Rabbi Yosef Karo, the author of the Shulchan Aruch, the most widely respected and held of uh, Talmudic scholar of the last thousand years, and Posik, by the way. So he believed in this, in, in uh, implementing this Maimonidean system of reinstituting the, the proper ordination of rabbis, judges, and the Sanhedrin. He held it. He tried to do it himself. So it's, there's no real halachic impediment. If there is any impediment, just because it's us as a society holding ourselves back. So I hope that I hope that uh, assures you now also you shouldn't shouldn't worry so much about getting a king. No, I'll continue praying how I pray, and uh, it'll evolve as it always does. Uh, so what? One last question, and this okay. is a little bit more challenging of um, different nature, um, and this is also a personal thing that I'm struggling with. And that is mm -hmm. uh, reintegration into society with uh, levels of trust of specifically religious authority that I used to have, which have which we were quite low even back then. Um, but uh, specifically, and, I, and I'm I'm censoring myself here for obvious reasons. But for those of us who were who were expelled from society, um, 
And uh, we have not gotten any sort of apology from any spiritual leader that were uh, who were egregious in their sins against us. Um, it ha- what are we supposed to do um, in to get spiritual guidance? And are, are we supposed to say to these people that that expelled us and and compelled us to take medicines maybe we didn't want to take? Um, are we supposed to just throw them out or or tell them to apologize or wait for an apology or just give up on it? And and how do how do we categorize these people? Are they irredeemable? What now? What do we do? Well, first of all, if you're, if you're sitting around waiting for pe- people to apologize, you'll be waiting a long time, as you know. Yeah. No one's going to apologize. I think the first time, this should be a good answer. Bishagam Uvasar. God says regarding mankind shortly before the flood. Bishagam Hubasar, Shagam with the dot in the gimel, the word shogeg. Hubasar, they're just flesh, they're mortal. They make mistakes. And there's a certain extent where we could just look at human beings and say, they're human. Like I said, you're not going to get an apology from them. Stick to Pirke Avos. Aseleharab Kinela Fafaver. Saying you're expelled from society, then that society didn't deserve you. You're supposed to acquire friends. Friends are acquired. It's not just, oh, I was around some people and government got us all paranoid and at each other's throats and almost, uh, snitching on each other. I remember myself, the, the biggest uh, experience I had right being in the whole fiasco and their threats of lockdown was seeing how neighbors turn against each other and want to suddenly report on others. Why do they do that? What, 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 what happened? And I realized, ah, this was happening in the Holocaust. It's a mute, it's a small minority, but all it takes is a small minority of snitches or people who are willing to defect, turn on their neighbors just in order to preserve themselves for a little bit longer. We have to look at the positives. So, the only the friends who you really earned, you have to earn a friend and they have to earn your trust and you have to earn their trust. If if you could suddenly lose some people so easily, it means they never were your friends or they never were the ones worth having. In regards to rabbinic figures, you actually can't just say, well, this is the rabbi, everybody else is following him, he's around. You have to find the right Rav for you. And by the way, it should be Ase. Why not Metse or Metza? Find a Rav. Why do you have to make the Rav? And this is an important one. A rabbi or any other religious figure only has authority because others are subscribing to him. What gives the rabbi his authority? The fact that he's followers. If he didn't have anybody listening to him, if he didn't have his kahila, so to speak, he would be nothing. He only has a lucky authority because people are asking him the question. They're they're going to him. So I say the means you have to empower your rabbis. If you see that that there were some rabbinic figures, prominent ones, and they have the whole garb and everything, and they're just spouting whatever it is that needed to be spouted, seems that they were just parroting whatever they're they're given a press release. Tell everybody X, Y, and Z, do X, Y, and Z, or else X, Y, and Z. You've seen that. So perhaps you should not be giving him your attention. You have to go find someone who earns your attention, someone who's thinking independently. I always said along, I wasn't even necessarily opposed to any uh, recommendations, any policies, public health wise, during uh, that whole period. I told people, if you need to want to know what to do for your health, make sure you have a doctor who knows what he's doing. Because I'll said, don't live in a town without a doctor, right? Back then, physicians were basically blood letters and teeth pullers. But, uh, you know, medicine certainly has advanced and, it's, you know, uh, open heart surgery saves lives sometimes. Yeah, some people die from it, but it does save lives. We've learned a lot. You should have had, you're Jewish. How do you not have a brother-in-law and a best friend or maybe even an uncle who is a medical doctor whom you can consult regarding these questions? Why are you listening to rabbis who all seem to be saying the same thing that's being put out by public press releases? Didn't you used to consult your doctor, your own doctor who knows your personal medical history and who knows you? Didn't you used to consult them with questions? Why did you suddenly start listening to government bureaucrats talking heads on TV and rabbis? It made no well, sense. The, the shot answer to that, the simple answer to that is that the, all these systems have become so centralized that everyone is infected by some level of it down, going from the top down and like electrifying everybody into zombies that it's hard to find even access to independent thinking anymore, even if it's your family, because they could be infected too. It's very hard to find these people. Yeah. So when it came to me, for example, asking these questions, I consulted with three independent doctors. I consulted with three with whom I am close to various degrees, 
fam familiarly and, and, uh, and also socially. And that's the only time I said, and whatever decision I get from my doctors has only to do with me as a person, it has nothing to do with even my wife and my children. Those have to be a separate question. Certainly, <coughs> friends and others should not be told what to do by my doctors, and it should not be told by, let's say, rabbis. And therefore, if you think that these rabbis misled you, it's your own fault for looking at rabbis to give you advice, medical advice, given to them by government functionaries. That was your mistake. I'll say, look, Rav. If your Rav is even getting involved, your rabbi gets involved in such cases, it means he's really overstepping the boundaries of his own expertise, if he has any. Well, it could be that he's compromised because he he collects a government salary, uh, yeah. whatever it is. I mean, it's the system has infected everything. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. We should we need to vaccinate the system. <laughs> All right. Oh, so look, don't 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 get too hung up on those things. Mm -hmm. you, can, you probably know now, just like I figured out who the real friends were through these crises, just seeing who's a, who's a willing to throw everybody under the bus. So you realize who your real friends are. Vladik Spiegelman, uh, if you remember Artie Spiegelman, uh, the cartoonist that came up with Mouse, uh, his illustrated uh, illustrated novels, a comic book depicting his father's Holocaust experiences. You familiar with it? No, so no. Artie Spiegelman. So he's a cartoonist from the 1950s, uh, American, like I said, son of Holocaust survivors. Mm -hmm. And he illustrated his father's story. Uh, the Jews are the mice in Poland and the Germans are cats. The Polacks are or pigs, etc. It was a very, very well received series of comics. And in his introduction, he gives a little bit of an anecdote from when he was a child back in uh, Regal Park in the, the, early, the late 1950s. And his so-called friends ran away from him. He fell and scratched his knee and his playmates ran away and made fun of him. And he went to his father, the jaded Holocaust survivor, Vladik Spiegelman, and said, my friends are so mean to me. He says, friends, Lock them in a room with no food for a week, and then you'll see what friends are. No, what really it is friends. So these experiences, the small crises, we didn't go through a Holocaust, thank God. We went through something that was like mild. We're, we're the marshmallow generation. Our experiences, our, our trials are much easier than those of our fathers and, and grandfathers. So we know what real friends are now. So too, we got to see, in case you were wondering who's a real Rav, who, who, really, who really should have rabbinic authority, halakhic authority, so this was a, a favor by God to show you who not uh, who to ignore, mm -hmm. who not to listen to, and who and whom you should be listening to. That's all. God gave you uh, God. God shed a lot of light on your predicament, and thank God. I thank God for it. We, it was it was a major learning experience. Good. Well, I I do agree with that. And uh, yeah, I have I have noticed in me that the healing is continuing. And uh, it should, and uh, the anger is dissipating, and it's actually it's being replaced by uh, a combination of hope and sadness at the same time. And it's hard to separate all these and filter it. Uh, but that's what's happening. So thank God. And um, both both emotions are very useful, both the hope and the sadness. And um, make and sure that, that no anger, hope, and uh, sadness is not something you should have a lot. Yeah. And hope is a good thing. Anger is strictly forbidden. If you consider anger to be something you're not allowed to have any drop of, and you have to actively purge the anger from your heart, you will only benefit. Yeah, I definitely that's have to work on that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and no, we all need to work as men, as men. That's a major Yitzhahara. But we only benefit from losing anger. Even a little bit of arrogance, a little bit of pride is good. A little bit of, uh, I guess, even a little bit of stinginess is good. Like Maimonides says, a spiel is a hub. But there's one thing you can't have: anger. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely none of it. And you'll you'll be so much better off. All right. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for joining me today, and I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I hope uh, the audience gets a lot from it, a lot of chizuk, a lot of uh, emotional and spiritual uh, filling up your tank. And uh, I'll see you soon, hopefully. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Anytime. Be good. All right.